Over the years, I've accumulated a number of record-setting death piles, and this is my process for coping with them, for dealing with them, getting through to the other side of a death pile. A death pile is a reselling term for a big, um, big hoard of unlisted inventory that you have accumulated because you source more than you list. There is uh, an imbalance there, and I guess the first thing to say is don't moralize about death death piles don't feel bad about yourself or think that you're a bad reseller because you have them everybody gets death piles so this just happens especially if you have a windfall and you just end up with a whole bunch of stuff and not enough time to list it or not enough energy to list it for example i have a bookshelf back here that is packed full of books that i got basically for free because someone was liquidating antique books at a flea market and I just, uh, I have this giant pile of books all of a sudden after one sourcing trip. Death piles can happen to anybody at any time. It's like a lightning strike or a shark attack. You can just find yourself buried beneath stuff. So when you do have the death pile, here's what I do. I make it a priority. I don't make it an exclusive priority. So I still source and I'll talk about why and how but i do i do make it the foremost priority to get through the death pile to the other side because especially if you spent money on each item or there's a lot of money invested it's just a liability you just now own a bunch of stuff make it a priority and the way that i prioritize it is i will set a daily timer for a budget uh, or a set amount of time that i plan to work only on the death pile and this is a good approach i found for listing in general, but it's especially useful for the death pile. So right now, because the death pile has been formidable, I'm right in the middle or, you know, towards the last third of, of my death pile. I've been doing this a lot of setting a daily timer for six hours on my phone and making sure that I spend at least six hours working just on the death pile. So nothing else counts towards that budget Shipping, packing and shipping doesn't count, sourcing doesn't count. Just working on the death pile. And you can start and stop, you can do it all in one chunk. I still have two hours left on my timer for today that I'll work on after I finish shooting this video. If you can't do six hours, do four, just do some increment of time on a daily basis. And after a few days, your death pile is gonna be gone. Like I said, that's actually my favorite approach to just listing in general. I can source for literally an entire day. I once sourced for 13 straight hours on my feet and uh, recently did 11 hours. So I don't, I don't need to set a time budget. I love sourcing as we all do, but I hate listing as most of us do. So if listing is a problem for you, take that approach. Try that approach instead of doing the, the item budget, which could also work. So if the timer doesn't work for you, working on a time budget and not worrying about number of listing quotas, try the number of listing quota. Try saying, I'm going to do 30, 40, 50 items per day. 50 is getting ambitious, but it can be done. Famously, there are people that do 100 in a day, upwards of 100. And just try it. Try one of those. Try setting a time budget or a listing budget and see which one clicks for you, so which one actually you adhere to. So do that. And... Probably the smarter thing to do instead of continuing to source while you do have a death pile is to just cease sourcing altogether and only focus on photographing and listing. If you can stand it, then do that. I can't. Uh, it's just, I have to thrift. I just took a big walk, not a big walk, like a 15 minute walk to a thrift store poked around. I'm not going to wake up in the morning, sit in front of my computer listing until bedtime and then go to sleep <clears throat> I'll lose my mind I've done that before but I'm, I'm gonna keep sourcing just realistically I'm gonna most of us are gonna that's why death piles are a persistent problem for people because you don't want to give up the fun part of the job and for good reason I mean again don't moralize about it it's fine that you want to source sourcing is the good part of the job it's natural that you would want to keep sourcing and it's not like it's not profitable even if you're sitting on a big pile of liability items. And I know people like to call it the money pile, do some kind of mental reframe on it. I like death pile. I think it, it 
it gives it a sense of urgency because it should have one. But anyway, how to source when you have a death pile. My approach is still source, but ratchet your standards up all the way to 10 out of 10. So you're going trophy hunting now. You're going for the lowest hanging fruit, the easiest money, the stuff that you would be stupid to pass on. So let me show you actually what I got adhering to that methodology today. This to me is, is like stupid dumb money. Stuff that I, I could not pass on with a clear conscience. So this was 10 bucks, two piece suit, it's double breasted vintage, and it's Brioni. Show you the tag. So a uh, Brioni two piece suit for 10 bucks. I didn't look it up. Could be worth 100, could be worth three, 400. I don't know what the demand is. I just know vintage Brioni suit for 10 bucks. I'm not gonna say no to that. I'll probably end up listing it for 100, making a quick flip out of it. Here's another item that I would have been really stupid to pass on. It's an SS Titanic knit wool turtleneck sweater that I got for eight bucks and very vintage. This honestly looks like it might be 50s or 60s. Didn't look it up, didn't have to. If this doesn't sell on eBay, I live within walking distance of, I think, four different vintage clothing shops. I will be able to turn profit on this. Here's a more bread and butter item. It's a Fox Racing motocross jersey. I don't think it's a cycling jersey. I'll use that keyword in the title as well. Cycling jerseys, I think, typically have the, the three water bottle pockets back here. This just has the one zip pocket. But I know from experience that if I price this at 15, it'll be gone. Probably if I price it at 20, it'll be gone. 15 for sure, cost a dollar because shirts were half off. Last item, four bucks for a pair of what looks like vintage polo sport cargo shorts in men's size 40, which is a big size. And cargo shorts like this are very, very on trend. If I list it for 20, it'll be gone. So I passed up a lot today. It looks like I got a lot for having a big death pile. I passed on a rag and bone wool blend women's blazer that had some very, very minor flaws. I passed on a free people pair of denim overalls just because the sell through didn't quite look correct to me. I found a huge, like this tall, Vintage made in USA LL Bean 100% goose down puffer coat, overcoat for women. That would have been standard price at six bucks, I think. No more than 10, certainly. But it had flaw, it had stains, conspicuous stains on the sleeve, stains here, stains here, and I just passed. I just passed because my standards are 10 out of 10 right now. It has to be in basically perfect condition. It has to be worth either a lot of money like the Brioni or it has to be no brainer, easy autopilot money like the rest of the stuff. And if it didn't meet those criteria, I just passed on it. There were a bunch of other things that I found that I just said no. I found a, a 4XL Big Dogs t-shirt, just gut check. This doesn't feel like it would be stupid for me to pass on it, so I passed on it. Something came to mind while I was sourcing in terms of being all bloated on inventory and trying to figure out exactly what it is that you want to buy. So I used to work as a fly fishing guide on Kodiak Island in Alaska. Kodiak is famous for having a really high bear population of Kodiak bears. And I ran into bears constantly, all the time, every day, there were bears everywhere. And there was this consistent pattern that would happen where early in the season, around June, early July, the bears would be new out of hibernation and they'd be really emaciated and skinny they would behave kind of erratically. They were a little bit more dangerous actually because they were hungry and they took more risks and they would just eat anything. They would strip a salmon carcass to the bone. They would eat rotten salmon carcasses. They ate uh, also a lot of vegetation, ate a lot of grasses and berries. And towards the end of the season, getting into fall, getting into September, October, 
The bears would be all fat and huge like you see in the magazines. It'd be these big, uh, burly bears, all fat, all, you know, stuffed up with, with salmon. And they would still eat salmon, but when they got to that stage, when they were so satiated that they weren't hungry anymore, but they still had the instinct to eat and stockpile nutrition for the winter, they would only eat the skin of the salmon and the brain. As weird as that sounds, and you would see it all over the place, salmon carcasses that had uh, had part of the skin stripped off and eaten, and there would be a bite taken out of the top of the salmon head where the brain is, and they eat those parts because those are the fattiest, most calorie dense parts of the fish, and they skip the rest. They don't want to expend the metabolic energy to digest salmon flesh. They just want the skin, and they just want the brain. And that's you when you have a death pile. You're getting ready for the winter. Uh, your innards are <laughs> impacted full of salmon, but you still want the skin, you still want the brain. You still want the stuff that you would be dumb as a survivor to pass on when it's easily available to you. So eat the skin, eat the brain, skip the rest. That is how I've approached death piles. I have done it the other way, which is just to sit and, and just put the belt between your teeth and do it all in one or two sittings. And I mean, it's worked for me in the past. I don't want to do that to myself again. And I also don't want to flagellate myself and say that uh, I've been a bad, bad boy and I'm not allowed to uh, go out and do the thing that I love the most in life. So hopefully this is helpful. This is just what has worked for me. It may or may not work for you. I hope that it does. And thanks for watching.